this is a video that leads into a a brand new very distinct not heard from before commentary on Isaiah 53 which begins actually in Isaiah 52 is comprised of seven videos I have put together in the last month or so and I'm just putting them all together uh, with a lead-in video explaining these things and and why it's so new novel and has such a different view of the scripture from that which Judaism teaches regarding a messianic era when David comes, the descendant of David, they uh, often refer to him as King Moshiach. Moshiach means the anointed one. And you'll get the idea from the title of this video real quick. God speaks to an atheist and it began like this. The doctors who gave me one month to live from lung cancer in 2002 that developed from my colon cancer, metastasizing, would have been surprised that I was still alive, to say the least. I had stopped thinking about the lung cancer years before. The white spots in the x-rays that filled my lungs, like the stars in the night, did not inhibit my breathing or slow me down in any way. At this point in time, I'm training for my first triathlon, and I didn't start small. I did a half Ironman. It's 1.2 mile swim in an ocean, 55 mile bike ride, and half marathon, 13 miles. They call it the uh, 90.3. One Saturday in the fall of 2007, I was cooking lunch in my small kitchen, post-divorce, <clears throat> and at the stove, when God said, from just a little behind me, as though somebody was speaking to me right here. And above my right shoulder, which is this figure, wash your hands. I turned around to the sink, washed my hands, and turned back to the stove. Now understand, I've been an atheist for 50 years. I mean, I completely denied the existence of God. And then from right here, a small, quiet voice, like an account they had with Elijah at the cave, said, wash your hands. And I simply turned around and washed my hands and went back to the stove. I didn't say a word to him. I didn't even keep thinking about it. I just did. That was it. Um, it was as though he had always been there. Just as to Adam, that's what I like in it, too. And he dictated this to me. This is from my book, uh, the book of my life that God dictated to me. It's called um, The Righteous Servant of God of Isaiah 53. No, The Life of God's Righteous Servant of Isaiah 53. And uh, he put it together. It's my, and he did it because he actually came to me as, uh, as Jeremiah would say, in the womb, but in my first year of life, uh, and like Ezekiel, lit and entered me. So that part of chapter 11 of Isaiah happened well over 63 years, 62 years ago. That's when that happened. That's when Moshiach was here. For all these rabbis and commentators who have been saying, he's here, he's here, no, he's here. Well, he's been here, I've been here a long time. I just wasn't prepared and hadn't, hadn't even heard his voice yet. But what he did, you know, with Jeremiah, he made sure he was a priestly, godly man and guided his life with me. It was to make sure I fit every single verse of Isaiah 53 as only I can explain it, what it's for, what it all means. And, and live a life of suffering familiar with disease. God chose to crush him with disease that he would offer himself for guilt and receive long life to so see his children. That's my proof that it happened. They told me 20 years ago, we can't treat this lung cancer. It's too advanced. You're going to die. 
and you're going to die real soon. You need to prepare for it. And it did crush my life. I, I stopped working. I just kept waiting to die. And I, I, I didn't die now. I'm training for, at this point in 2007. I'm training for a triathlon. I finally said the heck with it all. And um, that's the proof. Crushed with disease, exposed to death. That's in verse 12. Exposed to death. And uh, here I am. 20 years later, still going, hadn't seen a doctor since, he never received any treatment, which is unheard of with, with, with uh, lung cancer. And he had colon cancer before that and had skin cancer. I'm a man familiar with disease that God chose to crush the disease. And these uh, seven videos put together as one, obviously I wouldn't ask or want, and I couldn't do it. <laughs> To listen to them all at one time, but I know you can mark your spots and everything. But the it was spread out in seven different videos, and I thought, well, uh, the the next video I'll do, I'll have a preamble to it and explain this. This is not fooling around. Uh, once you learn my version, which comes from God, of when Moshiach comes, the day of the Lord, which is left out of the Messianic era. But if you ignore me, God says, as my role as Elijah, God says, when he does return to his temple suddenly, it's going to be with, and it's not there, it's going to be with utter destruction to the land. Okay, all this is explained, so I'm not going to keep going in detail and, and, and carry on with uh, uh, God first speaking to me. But it was as what Adam would have felt like. This is natural. I mean, to him, you know, having somebody speaking to him from above him, from up here, from within him, it's perfectly natural. It's, and, and he wouldn't be falling down in reverence and, and, and I'm not worthy and all that. It would just be this the person who's always talking to me and telling me what to do. The fact that he doesn't see him wouldn't probably enter into his mind. Just, you know, that's just the natural order of the world for Adam and me, particularly today, 13 years later. Still in God's fire of refinement, preparing me, and now we're taking, we have the books, they're unpublished, Jewish publisher, Christian publishers, you can, I, I dare not even send it to them, because how harsh I am on Jesus Christ, who said he was the man of Isaiah 53, and it's because of him I had to get crushed with cancer. That's what that's all about. God doesn't have to crush you to make you offer yourself for guilt. He just seized Ezekiel and put him through the fire of refinement, the anguish of it, and sent him off to be a prophet to the Assyrian Babylonian exiles, of which he was one, actually. The Ezekiel... Uh, Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel is the key to Isaiah 53. That's my backup. See, God, uh, these videos, everything, the way he, where he put angel of his presence and Holy Spirit that Judaism doesn't recognize. A host of the Lord's host. It's in the book of Joshua, one time. He did it so they wouldn't find it. He knew what this was going to be about. These are my proofs. This is what it's all about. He set it up for me to be this controversial. Just, you just got to take the Messianic era of Judaism and toss it out the window. And you'll understand why when God has me explain it to you. He controls everything I do, think, and say. Finishing preparing lunch and ready to watch a Texas A&M football game, I headed to the living room and God said, Get a napkin. I turned back to the kitchen and got a paper towel, sitting on the couch from about the same place. Sitting on the couch with the television on and my plate in my lap, God said, get your TV tray. I got up, set my TV tray in front of me and placed my plate on it, began eating and watching the game. That night, I was in bed reading a book from the doorway. God said, God said, tomorrow we're going to Bed Bath and Beyond to store to buy a shower curtain, sheets,
pillowcases, and shop in general for things that you need. I said, okay, and continued re reading my book. That's, that's God's slope to an atheist. That's how it started. <clears throat> we call it the early years now when we talk about it. It was so different from the way things are and all the same in the same breath. And I have since learned this. It was by his power upon my emotions and thoughts that his presence with me was though he had always been there. In other words, when you read in the Hebrew Bible, God calls somebody's name like little Samuel. And he says, here I am. Here I am. Now there's some accounts of people falling to the ground. But... Uh, he can, he, can, it's, it's a, he can put a silent knowing to you. He can put knowledge within you, your mind, where you never hear a word from him. In other words, put into your mind, the God of all creation is about to speak to you. And he doesn't have to say, stay calm. He controls emotions. He told me, Keith, I, I created emotion. And there's nothing I can't do with yours. And believe me, it's been proven to me. I'm not going to get into all that. It turned, oh yeah, then I, this, this story goes on. It turns out he had been like Jeremiah from the womb. Let me pass by that. I've never been affiliated with any church or synagogue. I've never had any teaching from yeshiva or uh, seminary. I, throughout my life, I did not. Let's put it this way. I was the actual opposite of Jesus Christ. Actual opposite. I, I'm a sinner. You know, I mean, he took me back. He said, look. You know, because I said, well, I wasn't that bad of a sinner. It was. <laughs> he says, really? Here we go off in vision like the story of Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas past. <laughs> I said, I started getting smart with him. This is us talking friend to friend. I can talk to him like he's just a buddy sometimes. There is a line I know not to cross. I said, that, why would you call that a sin? That's a, why is that a sin? He said, Keith, that's a sin. You lied. I said, yeah, but if I didn't lie, I was going to jail. He said, well, that don't make it good. I said, well, which comes first? Going to saving yourself? Or lying? And so what? I didn't believe in you anyway. I wouldn't worry about going to hell either. It's just, I didn't think about those things. He tells me, now, I didn't let you. That's why I was with you from the get-go. He wanted me to be fresh. No pre-ordained, pre-settled-in uh, thoughts and beliefs on, uh, on anything. And of course, I grew up in, in Texas for the most part, so it would have been Christianity. I didn't associate with anybody who was religious. I, I didn't even know what the term Jesus freak meant. I didn't even know that Jesus... Died for my sins, supposedly, under their theology. And I didn't know that there was a problem between Judaism and Christianity. Um, Jews and Christians, I didn't know that. I had plenty of Jewish friends. You know, I can't. I was in the late 60s, 70s, my formative, going into my teen years. And, you know, you treated everybody uh, as an equal. I never thought about it. Including African Americans, who it, in, in my day, we just said blacks. I, I guess that doesn't go anymore. But um, had great friends of all kinds. Uh, my best friend, I didn't even know he was Jewish until I saw him on Facebook 40 years later. <laughs> but anyway, let me, let me jump ahead. Okay, this, this, goes, this is how God communicates with mankind. This is what the prophets are all about. It's not just Ezekiel, a spirit lit, uh, lit and entered into me. At that moment, God was speaking. And then he says, at that moment, a spirit entered into me, and then I could hear God's words. So he's saying, and that means God is in his spirits. And um, it's just, just imagine... The presence of God is his mind, and it is composed of elements of the unseen realm that we can't understand, and spirit he created, and the angel of the, of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, 
He created, but that's completely different elements. His presence is different from God's presence. But they're like big clouds, and they can float together and be as one cloud. Okay, that cloud is what descends upon you. They are within me and without me. If you, this audience, was in a room with me, they would envelop you all around you. You'd be in the presence of God. The difference with me in that room is that that cloud engulfs me, flows through me. It's, it's within and without me, as though there's no break because of my physical structure. My little spirit is a little cloud that also drifted in. That's what it is. And it happened with all the prophets. If they spoke God's words, he was talking to them. He was telling them, write this down. Write this down. All these 20 books or so, of the books of the prophets, Ezekiel, write this down. I set this up. Jeremiah, write this down. See a time is coming. Well, that's the time in Malachi. It all comes together, and you'll find it in all these videos. So, and it doesn't just include Moses and the prophets. The man who wrestled with Jacob. Jacob says he wrestled with a man in divine beings. Well, you know, Judaism doesn't uh, acknowledge the Holy Spirit as a person, which is <laughs> I just, beyond belief because there's so many references that this is clearly a person, an angel of his presence. But it's just God going to a man saying, hey, wake up, I'm the God of this land. See this man over here sleeping? His name's Jacob. He's got his head on a rock. Go jump on him and start wrestling. Don't worry about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to orchestrate the whole thing. You'll be fine. And the guy would have said, here I am. Let's go. That's how he does. That's, that was, and, and, and Judaism says the man in divine beings is an angel. No, he's not. That'd be like saying, I'm an angel. And you wouldn't want to say that. Well, you wouldn't want to say it to me before he came to me, because that ain't made me mad. But I had a hell of a uh, temper, just like Moses did, and like Ezekiel did. And God knows how to knock it out of you, to where you smile and laugh a lot. Because <laughs> I never used to. Now, well, you got to read the book, and you'll get it. You'll get it. I'm just, you know, just like a lot of people, I've been through too much, hurt too much, suffered too much, to have any thought. There's anybody upstairs, you know, who cares about me. It's just don't, 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 don't even mention his name around me. <laughs> We're either going to fight or I'm leaving for it and you'll never see me again. Now do that. Because it just makes me angry. All that's gone, by the way. Lots of stories on that. Oh, and the Spirit speaks. He's got his own personality. He's, he's angelic. Uh, he has a, a, a very childlike voice. And uh, he has a, he's just nothing but a, a ball of humor. <laughs> he's just, he calls it, he didn't ask me to say he's the greatest comedian of all times of the universe. And uh, he's just a joy to talk to him. And, be, and uh, he has the smarts of God, as he tells me. But... Uh, I have instant communication with him. I have instant communication with God. It's like there's three persons in my mind. This one cloud is, is three clouds. It's two spirits in, a, in the elements of God's mind. And um, slow process of 13 years. And it's 13 years of, and this is from Isaiah 53, punishment, wounding, chastisement, maltreatment, crushing, bruising. And I'm telling you, he's relentless. It's in the stories, and I have a lot more once I get to Israel, and I have full confidence God's going to get it done. That's one thing I don't worry about. Thirteen years, uh, a year and a half of trying to get books published, denied uh, 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 by everybody who even bothered to answer me, because it's just so different. And it, it can only go to Jewish publishers, and it's just like, well, this isn't the stuff we believe, and it sounds like he's saying it's him, and this and that. Well, I was. God said, I made sure I didn't get them published. I wanted to do the videos first. You see, I'm not on the executive committee. I don't, I don't know what's going on 99% of the time. I don't know what I'm going to have for dinner. I no longer have self-will. I can't ask him for anything. 
there's all kinds of reasons for that, such as, you know, if one of my kids gets sick and he doesn't heal them up, you know, cancer or something, am I going to be disappointed? Am I going to be hurt? The answer is no. He's trained me too well to even bother asking if he's going to do it, he's going to do it. I know he has the knowledge and he's right here with me. So, you know, it's a long, uh, detailed process. I know things from his perspective. Uh, this is another reason the Messianic era is not going to happen. And it comes out in these films. But the Holy Spirit, the angel of his presence, uh, we can, we're friends. God says, I, I can't be friends with human beings. He, I said, well, we're friendly with each other. He says, yes, that's right. I said, uh, uh, you know, I got Googled this, and technically you are my friend. He said, well, I know, but I just don't acknowledge you. I said, why? He said, because I'm God. That's the way I am. I get to do whatever I want. Now, he's just messing with me. He's just like having a friend. Of course, it's a true statement. He can do whatever he wants. But he's pretty stately and regal. But, uh, again, we live together. I've lived with him for 13 years now. And it's never going to end until I die. I wouldn't even know what to do. Uh, and he said, if I let you, you're going to fall down dead. You're not supposed to be alive. I keep you alive. He said, I took that cancer from you, but I just put it back in. If you do something that makes me want to leave. I said, well, what am I going to do? No self-will. To an extent, no self-thought. And I told him, I'm not even a human being anymore. He said, well, what are you? I said, I don't know. I'm a man in divine beings, but I'm not a human. I don't have self-will. That's what distinguishes the human being from the animal. He said, but I'm being the human for you. I'm providing yourself with. So you do, in a way, have it. So you're still a human being. I said, well, I'm dead. He said, well, why are you dead? I said, because it's like my brain's not connected to my spirit anymore. It's like you're sending all the information in. And that's about heaven. I haven't lived the existence in heaven as to my thoughts. Because in heaven, you won't have a mind. The heaven for the Jewish people only, I might add. You won't have a mind. God's got to provide it for you. He's got to be you for you. As a completely new and different creature. It's still you. It's a very amazing story on how that does. And I'm taught all these things and literally experience them. Not only in the real, but in visions. I've had more visions than... You, if you count every single vision in the in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, I've had easily double that. And I'm a walking visual. God's communication, and this actually shows up in the story of Moses. He won't let me tell right now. But uh, he puts images in your mind. Instead of saying a sentence, you get something in your mind, a picture. Uh, anyway, I call it visuals. And you can be wide awake for those. And I can be envisioned right wide away. Okay, so we finished our shopping. <laughs> Shower curtains and everything. And God said, let's go to the bookstore and get you a Tanakh. To which I replied, well, what's a Tanakh? <laughs> I didn't have any, I didn't, Hebrew Bible, okay. Well, I know the Holy Bible. The New Testament and Old Testament. And on we go. I'm starting to learn for the first time. At Barnes and Nobles, we looked at all the Hebrew Bibles and purchased the Jewish Publication Society's Tanakh, the Holy Scriptures, which is a translation that began uh, in 1956. It was published in 85. Men who spent 30 years on the, Co on the Leningrad Codex, the oldest Hebrew uh, Bible in existence. They started from scratch. I hear these rabbis and people saying, well, I know what these translations are. This and that and that and this. And, and God says, just go with the JPS. They, they hit it right just about every single time. I've only found one thing that, uh, that uh, I don't understand how they missed it. But and it's in 53. This is the 1985 edition. That's the best translation you can get out there. And I don't just hear God speak to me. His presence is heavy. And I'm also, you know, it says he uh, uh, pinned Ezekiel's arms behind his back with his cords of power. And by his cords of power, Ezekiel could not leave his house. Now, that's in Isaiah 53. He took him from, took him from the land of the living. He took him from society. 
you know, the man of Isaiah 53 lives, so he's taken from society, but that doesn't, from the land of the living, that doesn't mean he died. And there's no crucifixion in 53. So, you start to see how Ezekiel is so important in this, and uh, that's where you find out about the covenants of friendship that come with God in the day of the Lord when Moshiach comes. Again, you don't hear anything about it in this Messianic era. I, I'll tell you this. I think the Jewish people are going to like this better. I think throwing out all that rubbish Judaism has been teaching from back in antiquity, that's where they're stuck, and, uh, and see what's really going to happen with God coming back, a man in divine beings, with the capabilities of Moses, Elijah, the descendant of David, all their attributes, okay, are in me. I can be each and every one of them, and I can be all four of them at one time. And God can speak to me. So, it's going to be fun, and he wants his temple rebuilt. That's, what, that's, that's the purpose of Isaiah 53. It says, a purpose which might prosper of God. But he doesn't tell us what the purpose is. Well, we find it in Malachi 3. I'm sending my messenger before me to clear the way for me, and I shall return to my temple suddenly. But the covenant that comes with David says, I'm going to place my sanctuary amongst you. He already knows it's not going to be there. And then we have Elijah in Malachi 3. Well, he's got a purpose that might prosper. And if it doesn't, God comes with utter destruction to the land. And again, you don't hear it with the Messianic era. Utter destruction to the land. There's 7 million Israeli Jews. How can you not read that and go, that sounds an awful lot, awful lot like, I'm going to raise up armies against you. How can you just ignore that? Well, anyway, we're getting it fixed up. And, and the purpose that might prosper, I never believed that. I think that just hooks the man of the righteous servant of God of 53. I think that puts him with, he's got the same purpose as Elijah. Elijah is supposed to bring the families back together uh, through the laws and teachings God gave Moses that or being mindful of them. That's the new covenant. It's an amendment. Uh, it's an amendment that also has a new inclusion of sin forgiveness. Over the last 63 years, God's presence has resided in Texas, Louisiana, Florida, and Hawaii. And he is more than ready to return to his land, Israel. Because wherever I am is where his presence is, and those are all the different states I lived in over this time period. Wherever I go. And in fact, if you see me in Israel down at the old city or down at Tel Aviv, uh, you, can, you can turn to your friends and say, hey, I know where God is. <laughs> he said, really? I thought he left. Some people say he died. <laughs> he said, no, you see that guy over there? He's all around that guy. And some say inside too. That's what it's going to be like. God says, we get to Israel, we're never leaving again. I said, I want to see Great Britain. He said, it's like, it's like did, did you just ask for something? I was like, oh. Yeah, that's good. I hope I... I, don't, I hope I fry if I hit the border and cross over. I hope I just burn up, burst in a combustible flame. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's where he wants to be. And uh, I, I'm assured he's going to get there. This purpose that might prosper, again, I think it just, it just shows the purpose of the righteous servant and a purpose of Elijah because he knew I was going to be teaching. There's only, in the day of the Lord, as you would imagine, he wants to fulfill, have all the prophecies fulfilled, be done with the prophecies. And there's only a handful, four men to come that we've never seen, um, the descendant of David, prophet like Moses, Elijah, and of course the righteous servant. We only have one description. Even the sages knew. you got to have a description of the descendant of David. It's Isaiah 53. They called him in the Babylonian Talmud the leper scholar. 
you'll see me referencing it uh, on just about every video. In other words, I'm saying, look, it's not Jesus, it's not the people Israel is taught today. It's this guy from the Talmud that just hadn't come yet. You just didn't know, didn't have a man that fit the description. Well, you do now. And two covenants. The, the friendship covenant, which is actually in two parts, Ezekiel 34 and Ezekiel 37. Uh, one part of which is I'm going to put my sanctuary amongst my people. And the other part, uh, interesting enough, has to do with the land blooming again, which is Jeremiah 31. See a time is coming. The land will bloom again. See a time is coming. The uh, cities after desolation of many years, 2,000 plus actually, will be restored in Jerusalem rebuilt. And the Jews shall never be defeated again. Okay, now we just talked about other destruction, like into armies being raised. But here it is in this friendship covenant. In this, no, no, Jerusalem being uh, uh, rebuilt. If that's done, then you'll never be defeated again. So, you know, you look and you go, well, there's kind of a problem between those two. And what I think it means is he's going to get the temple built now that Jerusalem's been rebuilt and he's come. That this might might prosper uh, because, you know, it kind of gets you. So why is the purpose of God might prosper? Who thought you could do everything? And he said, well, in a large part, my people got to listen to you. They got to, especially the rabbis, they never listen to my prophets. They're all full of themselves. Think they know everything. But he starts getting angry. And see, that's not good for me. Because I, all of a sudden, he wants to make me better, which means suffering. You got to keep him away from those moves. I'll tell the spirits, he's not funny. Got the funny guy around here. We talk friend to friend, too. Well, anyway, I'm going to let you, there's, there's a lot more, but this story is in, the, in my book. Hopefully after spending time and understanding who I am, that this is here, it's happening. I, I don't care what the rabbis think or say. Look, I'm a prophet of God. I'm a man of divine things. You know, if I say something contrary to what they think and say and believe, they're wrong automatically. It's a given because God is the one telling me all these things. It's his book. They're wrong automatically. And he is livid that I'm having this problem with Isaiah 53 being the people Israel. I, well, it's in the videos, but you ought to see the arguments they really put back before that for Isaiah 53, 10 and, and other verses. Uh, Rabbi Tobia Sanger, Irish Judaism, he went Christian. You know, the Christians went to the, the laws of Leviticus, animal, animal sacrificial laws, and said Jesus is the unblemished lamb. That's why, and they're using, you know, uh, Leviticus where you could offer a lamb and for unintentional sins, but nevertheless, they turned it into he was a human sacrifice, which he says himself. He says God no longer wants bulls and goats for sin. He's prepares my body for sacrifice. It's human sacrifice, and God made the sacrifice to Gentiles so they didn't have to obey his commandments and laws. You know, from an atheist who comes in with no religious background, I read that and I just, I look up face to face with God wherever he is at that moment, and I say, you got to be kidding me. People believe this? This is, this. he said, about two billion right now. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to bother trying to tell you how many there's been in 2,000 years. God made a human sacrifice to me so I can go to heaven and I can go kill somebody if I want to. I can go rob so I can go beat my wife and my kids. Huh. I accept Jesus again. I was so, God was teaching me the New Testament and uh, this guy at, at one of these mega churches uh, came up to me and says, you know if you do accept Jesus Christ, you're not just forgiven of all sins that you have committed. You're forgiven of every sin you're going to do in the future. I said, really? He said, yes, really. <laughs> he said, Jesus knows you're going to do it, and he already forgave you. I said, what? Okay. 
Because if you're a Christian, you can just sin all the time. Because Jesus knew you was going to do it. I hadn't actually heard that taught, but that's the effect of it. Okay. Next year in Jerusalem. Enjoy the books. Uh, don't try listen to uh, the videos. Don't try to watch them all one time. But what I did is I put them together for you in the order they should be. And uh, I just thought it would be easier. And we're, we're kind of coming to the end of our videotaping for a little while, it seems like. Again, I'm not on the executive committee with God and His Spirit. I never really know what we're going to do next. Um, and the books are at keithmccartymccarty.wordpress.com. You can find that on my YouTube channel. Um, I guess that's about it.